So I have to tell you, I spent an awful lot of time this week trying to decide where we should stop today. Should we stop with the palms? With the parade and the procession into Jerusalem? Should we leave ourselves the, the shouting and the hosannas and the, the cloaks on the road and this sort of scene of rejoicing and triumph and also longing, calling for God to save us? Should we stop there on this high note or should we keep going? Should we hear the rest of the story, hear Jesus' last day? The, when one of his friends, his disciples, betrayed him and he was arrested. And then when we joined the story with our reading, when he was put on trial and mocked and tortured and he was crucified, and when he died. And I wondered, with uh, so many things around us so heavy, with so much that changes so fast and so unpredictable, with the news about coronavirus, this COVID-19 disease, that, um, <clears throat> with everything that, uh, 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 all of this so that changes so fast, unpredictable, scary, heavy, and the epidemiologists that tell us that things are only just beginning, that we're only at the beginning of all of this. And I wondered, I wondered for a long time this week, should we just stop and stick with the happier scenes? There's a lot we could talk about there. We could talk about what it was the crowds were hoping for as they cried, Hosanna, save us, please. Oh, Lord, save us. We could talk about um, how they were honoring Jesus on his donkey and the foal as by putting down their cloaks and the palms so to say that not even the dust of the road will get on the hooves of your animal there. <laughs> we could talk about how Matthew, the author of this gospel, misunderstands, misunderstood Hebrew poetry. Because Hebrew poetry likes to put things in, in parallel. So saying the same thing twice in different ways, rather than rhyming, as we sometimes think of poetry. And so that, uh, uh, that quotation, look, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Those are meant to be the same thing said twice, but Matthew thought that was literal. And so somehow has, is envisioning Jesus and has Jesus riding on both the donkey and then the donkey's colt, the, the child of the donkey. Uh, I don't know if that's like a Cirque du Soleil kind of situation or what. Or we could talk about um, how what Jesus is doing here is absolutely the opposite of what uh, Roman leaders and kings and emperors would do, how they would enter a city in Jerusalem, it would be on the other side of the city from where Jesus is coming in. And Romans would come in with soldiers and with a, you know, one of those snorting stallions and armor and, and trumpets and all of that. And here, Jesus is coming in the other side on a donkey, very humble, and with a crowd of ordinary, regular people. We could talk about that, about how Jesus is saying very clearly that, yes, he's a king but he's not going to be a king like we're used to looking for. And we could talk about all of those things, and just in that one reading, it would make for a great day. Even if we don't get to see the young ones marching around the sanctuary with those palm branches that, in the hands of my kids at least, inevitably become a sword fight. But eventually, after a long time of wondering, where should we stop? I realized that, no, we need to keep going. We absolutely have to keep going. And what made the difference for me, what convinced me was when I noticed the difference between the last things that people say in the two gospel readings. So the first reading, you can look back. We had the crowds as he had gotten into Jerusalem and it said the whole city was in turmoil asking what I think is the most important question. Who is this? And it says the crowds were saying, this is the prophet, Jesus 
from Nazareth in Galilee. But then when you keep going, the last thing that you said in our second gospel is this. Truly, this man was God's son. And I realized that if we were to stop with the happy stuff, if we were to stop with the parade and the palms and the celebration, the cheerful and light stuff, we're left with a prophet. Jesus as human. Yes, someone who speaks for God. Yes, someone who's pretty remarkable. Think of recent prophets like Martin Luther King Jr., Rosa Parks, Mother Teresa, Oscar Romero. But prophets, you see, are as human as you and me. They just are invited to speak for God, share God's passion and God's heart. And if we stop there, if we stop just with the happy stuff, the celebration, what we are left with is Jesus as a good person, a good teacher, someone to admire, someone to emulate. But we're left with a human being. And if we stop there, all we have for our faith is a moral code, something for us to work hard at and try to achieve on our own. But when I noticed how our second reading ended with the gospel and what a difference that is, I realized that it's when we walk into dark times and it's when we have hear hard words, that's when we realize that this is God's son. Yes, he's a human, and yes, he's to be admired, and yes, he's remarkable, and yes, he's a prophet. But this is God's son. Because there is no human that would willingly choose crucifixion and betrayal and cross and death as the way to victory. That has to be God. Humans would pick glory and triumph and gold curtains and fancy carpet and, and TV ratings and success and all of the trappings that we're used to. But not God. God chooses suffering and pain. God chooses to be with the poor and the sick, those who are in prison, the migrants, the refugees. God chooses those who are locked in and can't get out. God chooses humiliation and death and the silence of a guarded tomb. God chooses to die as a traitor, as a lynched criminal, as a fraud and a phony. And God uses that to reveal who God really is. To see in those torture instruments glory and in death, to see the reach of God's love and mercy and power that will not let anything stand in its way, not even a guarded, walled-in, closed-up tomb. God's glory is seen in all the things that our world calls failure. see, when we keep going, we see that to get to resurrection, we have to die first. But because of the resurrection, because of Easter, because of Jesus, God's son, we always face death and all of the hard things in the light of resurrection. The two go together death and resurrection, you can't separate them. And if we do, we lose the power of God's love. We lose the mercy that God shows and we lose all the things that God does for us as he answers our cries, Hosanna. 
We have to keep going because Jesus didn't stop. But the way Paul said it, he was obedient. He kept going all the way to the cross and beyond. And because Jesus, the prophet, God's own son, because Jesus kept going, we know that both death and resurrection, life here and life to come, all the things we are and all that will happen to us, no matter what, are in God's hands. And nothing, not coronavirus, not being locked up at home, not sickness or fear or heaviness or darkness or any of the things that we are feeling, nothing at all. Nothing can pull us out of God's hands. So it seems to me this is the perfect year for us to experience that deeply. It's the perfect year for us to explore and sink deep into both the wonderful and also the hard stuff, to get to Easter through the difficult words and the real downers that come. This is the perfect year because we're not going anywhere, but also because we're in the midst of hard stuff in a dark valley. We're surrounded by scary news and things are so different and constantly, constantly changing. And when we're in a dark place, we need to know that Jesus is there. And the way we know is by remembering that Jesus was there first. Jesus is here in the dark places with us. And through those dark places, because Jesus is with us here, Jesus will be with us when we come out into the light. We need together to hear the joy and also the sorrow. We need to hear the celebration and also the hard words and the darkness too. We need to uh, hold those together, sorrow and expectation and celebration. Because we need to know that they are both in God's hands. The good news is, this is Holy Week. And Holy Week is designed for just that thing. Just that thing to hold both of those together. And maybe that's something you've known for a long time. Or maybe that's something new for you to sort of experience fully what it means to go through all the steps that get to Easter. Maybe you're being invited to sink into that deeply for one of the first times. Or you, this is familiar territory. But the good news is, Jesus is here. No matter where we are or no matter what happens, we are in God's hands. And this week, together, we get to experience all the whole journey with Jesus. Together. Welcome to Holy Week. Amen.